Okay, good afternoon and good morning uh, for those of you uh, in Asia. Uh, I'm Giyuk Shin, uh, Director of Schorenstein Asia Pacific uh, Research Center and also its Korea program. I hope uh, everybody is doing uh, very well and staying safe uh, wherever uh, you are right now. So India is experiencing the worst crisis uh, right now. So I sincerely hope that uh, things will get better soon uh, in the country. Okay, this is uh, our fifth uh, webinar series on the theme of the United States uh, in the Biden era, uh, views from Asia. Uh, this quarter we are discussing how Asian countries perceive the United States under the Biden leadership and what they expect uh, from the United States, uh, domestic and foreign policy, and how these perceptions and expectations affect the US-Asia relations. So today our focus uh, is Korea. Many Koreans were relieved by Biden's victory, but were left wondering where his policy toward China and North Korea uh, would be heading. Under Biden, for example, uh, Koreans expect better alliance management but are concerned that North Korea nuclear issue may not get much attention. They also watch his China policy closely as a US-China conflict uh, put the South Korea in a very difficult position of having to choose one or the other. Today, we have uh, two uh, leading experts of Korean national uh, security and trade. And I'm very, very happy to have both of them uh, today. It's early morning uh, in Korea, and thanks for joining us uh, from Seoul. Uh, Congressman Jo Tae-young and Professor An uh, will be addressing uh, political security, economic and trade issues pertaining to uh, US-Korea relations. As you know, there will be the first summit between President Moon Jae-in and Biden in Washington uh, next week. So today's uh, discussion uh, is very important and also uh, timely. Okay, the Honorable Cho Tae-young is a member of the National Assembly of uh, Republic of Korea. He serves in the Committee on Foreign Affairs and Unification, as well as on the Committee on Intelligence. He's a member of the Conservative uh, People Power Party, the main opposition in Korea. So before uh, being elected, to the National Assembly uh, last year. He served in the government uh, for almost you know, 40 years, uh, mostly in the foreign ministry. So he was a deputy director of the presidential office of national security and also vice foreign minister. He also served as Korean ambassador to Australia and to Ireland. Now, Professor uh, An Dok Geun uh, is the Dean of International Affairs and Professor of International Trade, Law and Policy at Seoul National uh, University. Among many uh, you know, important uh, accomplishments, uh, he served uh, as a commissioner <clears throat> of Korea's uh, Trade Commission, a member of National Economic Advisory Council and chair for CPT CPTPP uh, Strategy Forum. Uh, Professor An was president of the Korean Association of Trade and Industry Studies uh, in 2020, and the Korean Society of Trade uh, Remedies in 2019 and 2020. So once again, uh, thanks for joining us uh, from Seoul uh, early in the morning. So without further ado, uh, let me turn to uh, Ambassador uh, Jo Tae-young. Thank you very much, Professor Shin gi -yuk. It's so glad to see you again, albeit uh, the, through Zoom rather than in person. And it's a certainly a great honor for me to be part of this very important discussions today with an informed audience on a very important subject to both United States and ROK. And, um, uh, and thank you for the kind introduction and uh, to me. Uh, the, actually, I've been in Korean government for almost 40 years mostly in the foreign ministry, but I focused upon security issues 
alliance issues and North Korean nuclear issues. So I'm a diplomat, but with a lot of exposure to the security issues. Now, uh, let me begin by saying a general comment about Biden administration. The Korean people believe that the Biden presidency bodes well for the Korea-US alliance and for the US allies in Asia. During the presidency of Donald Trump, Asian states were often left to themselves to assertive pressures from China, although some of those actions by China were direct challenge to the US-led regional and international order. For example, in July 2019, China and Russia conducted a joint Air Force exercises in the East Sea for the first time. During the exercises, Chinese and Russian military aircraft entered Korean Air Defense Identification Zone, Cadiz, and Russian planes actually intruded into the, air, the territorial airspace over the islands of Tokdo. Chinese airplanes again entered Cadiz above the sea in December last year. These issues went almost, almost unnoticed by the United States. The Biden administration, on the contrary, emphasized the importance of the alliance as well as the networking of allies in Asia. Asian states, I believe, can now expect different policies and different priorities from the United States. From the ROK standpoint, there will also be significant changes and shifts in the emphasis of the US priorities and policies in this region and uh, regarding the US ROK Alliance. Among others, I'd like to share my thoughts with you on four issue areas, North Korea, Alliance management, China, and last but not least, Japan. North Korea. Uh, from my perspective, nuclear diplomacy during the Trump presidency has several problems. One problem was that there was no or very little progress on the actual denuclearization of North Korea. And of course, this was not a US fault. This was because uh, Kim Jong-un and North Korea consistently and persistently rejected the real and meaningful negotiations for the, uh, with the aim of denuclearization. However, the lack of progress was obscured by the optical illusion of Trump-Kim summit diplomacy with some attendant negative consequences. Two, more importantly, ROK-US coordination was tested rather severely. President Trump disregarded North Korean provocations against the ROK. His attitude did not change even after North Korea made huge efforts to strengthen precision strike short range missiles and MRLS targeting the ROK. He summarily and unilaterally suspended the ROK-US joint exercises. Actually, Moon Jae-in government uh, didn't have many problems with, the, with those policies. They just wanted the United States to engage in a dialogue with North Korea, no matter what. But those Koreans who value the alliance and who are wary of North Korea's intentions and threats were very concerned and sometimes agitated. Under the Biden administration, I believe the US will focus more on actual denuclearization of North Korea. And hopefully the Biden administration will do a better job of countering North Korea's effort to drive a wedge between ROK and the US. So what kind of policies, North Korea policies will Biden administration pursue? North Korean policy review has been completed as it is reported and uh, new approaches being called sometimes uh, calibrated and practical approach. And then in London, uh, another word, a complete verifiable, uh, it is the irre irre irreversible abandonment 
the word CVIA was used. Details are not fully known, but it is very clear that uh, Biden approach will, will put emphasis on US being viewed as very serious about negotiating with North Korea. Biden administration say they will take a phased approach. They say they can build on 2018 Singapore joint statement. They say Biden will maintain sanctions unless progress is made on denuclearization. They do not say, they do not talk about Biden, Kim Jong-un summit upfront at least. So Biden administration will not pursue a summit driven or photo session driven diplomacy with North Korea. Some conservatives here in Seoul may be disappointed, especially because the Biden administration did not reject the 2018 Singapore joint statement. As far as I'm concerned, with uh, Biden ad administration not giving sanctions relief, not promising some in meeting to North Korea, rejecting the Singapore joint statement would be probably too much and would give an impression to North Korea and China that US is not actually serious about negotiations. After all, the joint statement is very brief and does not contain a lot of substance. So maybe it's okay. What is more important to us and to North Korea is what kind of first stage agreement Biden administration will pursue. I believe that North Korea's offer in Hanoi lifting all meaningful sanctions in return for Yongbyon nuclear facilities probably is a non-starter for Biden administration. Because if, if they do that, the Republicans will have a field day on the Hill denouncing Biden policies. What will be North Korea's response? North Korea will try to appear strong they, re they have rejected the US offers to for a meeting a couple of times, but eventually I believe North Korea will come out and listen to Biden's North Korea policies. Why? Because Kim Jong-un is actually under pressure. His state coffers probably are being emptied and Kim Jong-un does not have many options if they reject to meet with the Biden administration. And Kim Jong-un seems to be, I think, a, actually a risk averse person than uh, the popular perception indicated a couple of years ago. And also the sound bite from Washington this year rather uh, enticing. So I believe that if the US can put in some of the other elements, the chances of US North Korea meeting actually is very likely. U.S. needs to uh, secure China's help. And U.S. can say that um, they have a message from President Biden to Chairman Kim Jong-un and North Korean government, North Korean officials cannot refuse, refuse to receive the message from U.S. President uh, directed to their dear leader. And also I have, uh, I have seen the reports this morning that U.S. government is actually uh, considering uh, providing coronavirus vaccines assistance to North Korea. I think if that's the case, it is also a very good idea to entice North Korea. So, but, uh, so beginning the meeting, having the first meeting, I think is probably very, very likely. What is more difficult is to predict what's gonna happen after that. North Korea has two options, provocations or being engaged in negotiations in search for a good, uh, the first stage agreement that can relieve economic sanctions. But fundamentally, unless Kim Jong-un makes a decision to forego nuclear weapons, the negotiations probably will not make a, a lot of progress. So negotiated solution is uh, admittedly a long shot and the ROK must prepare for the success as well as the failure of the negotiations. First and foremost, ROK will, will find a way in cooperation with the United States to strengthen the nuclear and conventional deterrence uh, against North Korea. Now the alliance, 
uh, there are immediate issues and long-term challenges to the Alliance. It is good that burden sharing issues are now out of the way. While there are some problems in the details, I, I welcome the conclusion of the SMA agreement. What is, um, I think, important uh, now is to restore a military-to-military -military trust, a military-to-military -military dialogue, so as to a, uh, restore the basis on which two governments can try and find the solution to tricky outstanding issues. Many outstanding issues are there, but if you read, try to read the a defense minister's joint communique last year, all these problems and outstanding issues are, are there, laid bare for all to see. This should not have happened and this demonstrated that military to military dialogue has been undermined. The many issues, but two most important issues to me is one, a conditions-based upcon transition. And the second, the issues of maintaining a, the, uh, the uh, adequate readiness and combined defense posture. And this involves, of course, and joint military exercises and exercises in general. Now, China. The Biden administration obviously perceives China as a major strategic challenger. Broad consensus has been uh, formed within the US policy circles for some time. So it is no surprise that Biden administration's basic perception about China is not, is not very different from Trump administration. That said, uh, actually, I had been wondering whether the Biden administration will start out with a more cooperative approach vis-a-vis -vis China, or will, st will start out with a more hardline approach or with vis-a-vis -vis China. It seems to me that Biden administration, with Ambassador Kurt Campbell coordinating policies in the White House, has decided to start out with a high line, high, um, the the, the hardline, I'm sorry, hardline policies vis-a-vis -vis China. Probably it's the a, it's a right thing to do because um, it is important to set the tone for the relations between uh, US and China. I'm sure that uh, as we progress, uh, then the Biden administration will try to uh, the increase cooperation with China, especially in the issues like um, the climate change and um, the the uh, climate change and, 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 and some, some of the other issues. Now the, um, but, um, the, um, but uh, while the, uh, the direction of the policies are rather similar, the way they approach the issues are rather different. The Trump administration were focusing upon reducing trade deficit with China and find a way to help American farmers in the Midwest. Biden administration on the country seems to be pursuing a more systemic and structured policy, focusing on ensuring that China will not be in a position to challenge or supersede the United States, especially in the cutting edge technology or the technological standards. It had been expected because Secretary of State, State Tony Blinken last year actually talked about a tech democracies and tech autocracies and competition between the two. Now, the, these uh, Biden policies, of course, force the Moon Jae-in government to make important policy decisions sooner rather than later, especially in the issues like semiconductor, 5G, and so on. So, and I believe that in, in those areas, actually Korea's choices are, are very, very clear, pretty obvious. Quad is the issue of the day in Korea. And there, are some conf there is some confusion about quad. Um, the, um, the, some Koreans believe that actually the United States had invited ROK to join quad and Moon Jae-in government rejected the offer. But um, the Moon Jae-in government's foreign minister actually uh, said that there was no discussion about are okay joining Quad. So there is some confusion. Uh, I, could, I could surmise 
what actually is being discussed between the two countries. But in any case, when the uh, summit meeting between Moon Jae-in and Biden happens in Washington DC next week, I hope that this confusion will be cleared and quote issue will be discussed in a serious manner. Regardless of the actual discussions between the two countries, I believe that um, from our case perspectives, joining Quad, while risky, is the right thing to do. Given the assertiveness of, assertiveness of China around the Korean Peninsula, China of today is very different from China of 1990s. So Korea will have to be serious in his search for answers. And actually, Korea can begin to work with Quad in, in non-military areas very, very quickly. Finally, uh, Japan. Well, worsening of Korea-Japan relations have negative strategic implication for the United States. Uh, the Trump administration, I believe, has not paid sufficient attention to this problem. But Biden administration, I believe, will become more proactive in encouraging both countries, Korea and Japan, to mend their offenses. The US had played similar roles in the past. Difference is that this time, actually, Japan is reluctant to engage in a dialogue. Like it or not, diplomatic engagement must happen if a solution is to be found. Dialogue is also useful to prevent the situation from getting worse. One more thing, just pursuing the uh, judicial solution, whether it is arbitration or going to the International Court of Justice, is, is not an answer. We have to lay the diplomatic groundwork with or without pursuing the judicial solution to be able to solve the problems between Korea and Japan, because our goal is not finding a judicial answer to the problems facing Korea and Japan, but find a way mm -hmm. to, main, to manage and improve the relations between Korea and Japan. So without diplomatic uh, groundwork, if we go to the court, it can be like a divorce proceedings and something that I don't want and nobody wants, I believe. The um, outstanding issues for Korea and Japan, the central issues are very, very hard issues because it involves the uh, judicial rulings of, or in Korea, the Supreme Court rulings in Korea. So um, Korea and Japan will have to put their heads together to find a solution. In the meantime, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to, good thing to, to, to uh, strengthen trilateral cooperation, especially trilateral security cooperation among three countries, US, Japan, and ROK. So it is a good thing that trilateral foreign ministers meeting took place in Washington, DC. It is a good thing that um, trilateral intelligence chief meeting happened in Tokyo, obviously. I, I believe it's a good thing if uh, we can have a trilateral summit meeting on the margins of G7 or G20 meetings. And also it is a good thing to restore and uh, strengthen trilateral exercises like search and rescue exercises or missile warning exercises, the kind of exercises that had happened before but that had been undermined recently. So in conclusion, um, the, I believe that um, the Korea and US, the alliance faces immediate challenges and more mid to long-term challenges because the geopolitical uh, tectonic plates are moving in this part of the world. So this is very, very important for two countries to try to find a solution together. The last time the US and Korea come up with a vision of the alliance was I think 2009, 12 years ago. And I think it's high time for two countries to come back to the drawing board and uh, try to find a common vision of the alliance for the future. Two things very briefly. One, coronavirus vaccines. In Korea, Korean people uh, is eager 
to hear the news that uh, actually President Biden would help President Moon Jae-in and Korean government to secure more vaccines uh, in, in the short term. And um, the Korean people will be very grateful if President Biden offers his help. I hope that the uh, US administration will take that into consideration. Second thing, now that uh, you are having a um, US ambassador in Tokyo, the former Congressman Rami Emanuel, very important person, I hope that um, US ambassador in Korea will be appointed and named very soon. And we look forward to having US ambassador in Seoul. And in, this, in addition to that, I hope that the Biden administration will appoint the North Korea Human Rights Envoy. The position had been vacated, had, had been vacant for, for four years, <laughs> but I think it is important to, a, um, to address North Korean human rights issues uh, in the context of overall North Korea policies. So I'll stop here uh, and, and I thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation, uh, raising a lot of uh, you know, important and difficult issues. You know, this quarter, we've been also uh, doing series on uh, North Korean uh, human rights uh, issue uh, in collaboration with uh, Bob King, uh, who was the only actually, uh, you know, special envoy for US government on North Korean uh, human rights. So we continue to work on, on the issue. And regarding uh, vaccine, uh, you know, I've been, you know, arguing for, you know, vaccine diplomacy uh, for North Korea, but I guess now we should argue for South Korea uh, as well. But uh, we'll come back to uh, some issues uh, for, for the discussion. But now let's turn to uh, Professor An uh, from Seoul National University. Thank uh, you very much. On. Yes, um, I'm very honored to join uh, this wonderful webinar. For the sake of time, let me be uh, uh, brief. And if there is any other uh, inquiry or question, then I'll probably follow up. Uh, of course, when Biden administration uh, begins, uh, the, the Korean government uh, is very uh, happy to deal with this new team uh, because the, especially from the trade or economic policy point of view, uh, it seems much more stable and predictable. So uh, we are not uh, worried about like uh, the national security based trade measure. Uh, known as Section 232 measure uh, and so forth. Uh, when Trump administration imposed the huge tariff barrier under the name of Section 232 measure, a uh, country like Korea uh, became really hopeless. We don't know how to deal with this problem. Uh, legally speaking, this is obviously the violation of the WTO rule, uh, but WTO is not working properly at this moment. So. Uh, but now, uh, the message from the Biden administration is much more promising. Uh, now, by the, the President Biden, uh, they announced that they will uh, the rebuild the WTO and then try to respect the global trade rule and order and so forth. So, uh, the Korean government tried to rebuild the economic and trade relationship with uh, the United States. And in that uh, regard, the Korea is the current president, the Korean president actually announced uh, and showed a strong interest in joining CPTPP. Mm -hmm. uh, after US left TPP, uh, it became CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive TPP, and it was actually ratified. And the Korean government showed a strong interest. And now we are uh, tapping the CPTPP parties to see uh, when and how uh, we may join the CPTPP. But it's not like we are actually setting the, the date to join actually CPTPP uh, agreement. Uh, I, I believe this is a strong signal uh, to move that, that direction. After we signed our CEP negotiation, uh, we basically tried to rebalance uh, the, 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 between the China and the United States. So by uh, checking whether we are prepared to join the new trade regime under CPTPP, 
basically we try to prepare ourselves to join whatever uh, economic alliance the Biden administration may propose uh, uh, in uh, later. But we do also have some concerns. Um, for example, when Biden administration announced uh, worker-centric trade policy, it, it is very, very uh, uh, desirable uh, trade policy. Uh, but from the trade partner point of view, <laughs> we wonder what this policy uh, may bring about. What kind of actual measure will be implemented? The worker-centric trade policy, in a way, it sounds very innocuous, but it, it sounds like uh, the US government put much more emphasis on uh, manufacturing workers, uh, middle-class people. Of course, this from the domestic policy point of view, this is very de desirable uh, policy, but to do so, probably it may entail much more uh, strong uh, the implementation of trade remedy measure like anti-dumping action, countervailing measure, and so forth, uh, because they need to protect the domestic markets. Also, the, the executive order uh, for supply chain risk. Uh, as the first executive order uh, issued by the President uh, Biden, uh, this the supply chain risk review and to come up with some, some policy to deal with this problem has been announced. It was very, very surprising. Normally before, I mean, for example, the semiconductor area, during the 1980s, when US government had a concern about the rising, the Japanese semiconductor industry sector, at the time the governments are uh, trying to communicate with each other and then trying to come up with some kind of agreement. At the time, semiconductor agreement has been established and then it was enforced uh, very strongly. Um, but this time, when supply chain risk review is implemented and then President Biden summoned the key CEO uh, globally, then the problem is here, other countries government has no room to interfere or to communicate with the US government. So for example, the Korean government point of view, the semiconductor industry is one of the most important industry sector for Korea. And now Samsung and SK Hynix are making huge and very significant investment this season, probably to uh, bring their uh, manufacturing facility into United States. <clears throat> In this process, Korean government is completely excluded. So this kind of situation uh, raises some concern in this part of the world. Uh, also, uh, when the supply chain, the stability uh, of supply chain in the United States is empathized, then from the, for, for example, from the Samsung electronics point of view, if they build the nice factory manufacturing facility in the United States, then they'll be fine. Uh, whether they have a, the, the factory in China or whether they have a business in, in with uh, Chinese counterpart actually is irrelevant issue. But in case US and China relationship becomes much more aggravated, then now we are worrying uh, kind of the secondary sanction situations. In case uh, Samsung has a deal or transaction with a Chinese company, then probably they, that kind of transaction may be uh, uh, restrained. Then such situation is still uh, uh, possible. So we are worrying about uh, those situation. Uh, also, the, another concern is even during uh, Trump administration, many countries were actually outside uh, in a way like uh, the, the uh, bystander uh, the, for the US-China trade war. But when Biden administ administration emphasized the strategic alliance among basically the ally countries, uh, openly 
uh, more and more country joined the, the, this alliance. Now, Korean government, <laughs> very surprising me, <laughs> is not yet, uh, I'm, well, did not make clear <laughs> which position <laughs> we, we have. We still insist that we are neutral. <laughs> Um, so, uh, although the Korean government tried to become neutral and <laughs> tried to insist on this neutral position, it may look like anti-US uh, alliance uh, party, as the Congressman Joe actually alluded. So, this kind of situation actually raised more and more complicated situation for uh, Korea. Uh, lastly, uh, we, we we have one important area, uh, Korea and uh, United States uh, can cooperate uh, in digital trade uh, uh, agreement. Uh, the US government is very strongly push uh, this agenda, digital trade agreement. Out of nowhere, TPP showed the surprising 18 article uh, chapter on uh, e-commerce. And then later it became a uh, digital trade chapter and when US and Japan had trade agreement, actually they established the standalone independent digital trade agreement. Uh, it embraced a lot of interesting issue. Uh, it is very surprising to see how this digital trade agreement rapidly evolved. So with just a few months gap, uh, the new uh, new, the more recent version of uh, digital trade agreement include very surprising chapters, including nowadays AI, the artificial intelligence, even submarine uh, cable system and the blockchain and more and more digital uh, standard and so forth. Uh, the Korean government, as you know, uh, announced very ambitiously digital New Deal project. So Korean government is pushing uh, uh, lots of uh, new policy uh, in developing, to develop the digital uh, economy. And in that sense, the Korean government is very keen uh, to join in this endeavor. In fact, uh, within a couple of months, probably the Korean government will announce the very first major digital trade agreement with Singapore. And then we are also uh, thinking to join uh, another uh, much more uh, the updated version of digital economic partnership agreement currently arranged among uh, Singapore, Chile, and uh, New, Zealand. New Zealand. It was known as DEPA. Uh, Korean government is, uh, is preparing to join uh, DEPA uh, as well. So uh, probably, Although the comprehensive FT negotiation may not be uh, pushed by the Biden administration in any time soon, but digital trade agreement is a different story. Uh, they don't need the negotiation authorities. It is very industry specific idea. Uh, probably in that uh, endeavor, the, the Korean government will uh, try to cooperate with US government. Okay, let me stop here. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor An. Also, uh, excellent presentation, and then raising a uh, lot of issues. Okay, so uh, you know, please send your questions uh, through Q and A box. Uh, we got already uh, several questions. Uh, let me uh, start uh, with a question that may be relevant to to both of you, uh, which is, uh, as both of you applied, uh, there is certain perception, uh, let's say, in Washington. Uh, that uh, the current Munjie government uh, is uh, somewhat leaning towards China, if not really toward China. Uh, but I think uh, a recent uh, survey shows a uh, fairly strong anti-Chinese sentiment among Korean people. I mean, this is one question that I get there quite a bit. Uh, how do you understand the gap between sort of, uh, you know, you know, you know, policy tilted toward China by the government, but then rising anti-Chinese public sentiment. So how, how can you know, you know, reconcile uh, that gap? Right? That, that's one question. So we are trying to understand whether that is really true. Uh, if so, then how, how to make sense of the, you know, the gap? So that's one question. 
And the other one, I think there's a question from the audience that, sure, I mean, you know, the current government is trying to have a certain balance between uh, US and China, and also people in Korea are saying that maybe United States uh, for security and you know, China for economy, but then eventually South Korea will have to choose one or the other. I mean, as Professor, you mentioned, uh, they are trying to remain neutral or even maybe strategic ambiguity, but now given intensifying in the US-China uh, competition over technology and other area, uh, how can Korea avoid uh, to be in a situation that they have to be one or the other? So those are you know, two questions, it's a big question, but then I welcome uh, your response. Well, the, yes, it is true that um, the anti-Chinese uh, sentiments among the Korean people have risen, or rather the Korean people uh, they have begun to have a rather realistic and, and, and balanced views about China. And um, so this is probably a very, very important trend and very, this, this is a very, very important background on which the policies of Korean government, any Korean government, vis-a-vis -vis China will be formed. So this is a very important trend. And we saw that Korean people saw that um, China resorted to a economic coercion to try to uh, the fulfill its um, foreign and security policy objectives. And uh, many countries do that, obviously, but China uh, the, uh, raised it into another level. <laughs> so we all mm -hmm. saw that, and that's very important. So my point is that uh, the public opinion this popular perception is real, and it is a very, very important element in the policy formulating by any Korean government vis-a-vis -vis China. The second question has to do with, you know, the balancing between US and China, or how the Korea can will choose between the two. I think we'll have to be a little more uh, specific about these questions. I believe that when it comes to security questions, US is the sole treaty ally of the ROK. So when it comes to security questions, we have already chosen uh, our policies uh, in, in large measure. And mm -hmm. uh, true to the alliance is, uh, is a thing to do uh, for Korea. When it comes to other issues, non-security, non-military issues, I believe that um, ROK will have to take a um, issue-specific, issue-oriented approach based upon our national interests. And Korea, for example, is a trading nation. So we'll have to respect mm -hmm. a WTO rules, international norms about the trade. Should the US uh, ask for, uh, I don't think it will happen on the Biden administration, but should you, the US ask the, the ROK to join in, in a move that probably is not consistent with WTO rules, as a trading nation, ROK should oppose and shoot uh, the, the, make the points uh, based upon our national interests. And secondly, I hope that ROK will come up with some kind of a framework uh, on which we can uh, the, make decisions. So for ROK, I think we'll have to have international norms and interna international rules on our side and consistency uh, should be on our side. And that will uh, raise the level of uh, expectation uh, from both US and China. And that way, perhaps, ultimately, the frictions will decrease. So we'll have to make our policies uh, more expectable, more, more, more anticipated, more, more predictable uh, for the United States. I completely agree with uh, the Congressman uh, Joe's comment. And uh, let me just add a couple of points. <laughs> Uh, for uh, economic uh, positions, uh, the currently basically U.S. government, Biden administration, is trying to rebuild the global trade order. Uh, there, there are the lots of issues in the WTO system. WTO uh, system began 1995, and so far, nothing has been changed. So there are numerous homework to be done. So now uh, is a trying to rebuild the system. And in that effort, as a trading nation, Korea should join this effort. Also, uh, the, the, as, as I uh, briefly expl explained, the digital trade uh, area. 
situation is very similar to like 1990s. In the early 1990s, US government, when they built the WTO system, they uh, prepared very surprising new global trade rule known as uh, the services trade rule. Early 1990s, economists didn't have any statistics about the services trade. So mm -hmm. in fact, economic principles teach services area is, is exact, very uh, clear example of non-tradable economic activities. That's what I learned from the classroom. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly, globally, WTO come up with services trade rule and then it embraced 155 services subsectors and then liberalize entire services area. That is how we are living like this nowadays. Globally, the way people live becomes very similar is because services uh, has been significantly liberalized and then uh, very substantially kind of standardized. Uh, now the situation is similar, digital trade area. We have no idea how we measure digital trade area. So economists mm. actually they, they cannot say anything about this area. But then, as I mentioned, digital trade agreements are being established. And one of the recent digital trade agreements covers like more than 40 page long document. Very surprising. So uh, we will have a new trade order again here. The Korean government have to join here. In incidentally, the Chinese government will not be able to establish a new trade rule or never try to initiate this kind of endeavor. So the Korean government, the trade policy uh, direction is clear. We will try to join and cooperate with the Biden administration to rebuild the world trading system and so forth. Um, but uh, well, in the world, about 70 countries uh, has China as the largest trading partner. Mm -hmm. The Korea is one of them. So China is an important country, but that does not necessarily uh, to keep Korea from uh, cooperating with the United States. So let me ask one, uh, you know, follow up question uh, to both of you. Uh, you know, Congressman Joe mentioned about, you know, cooperation on specific issue, you know, issue by issue. And Dr. mentioned about, you know, digital, you know, trade. And so, you know, this is my view, it's a, you know, more like a hypothesis, but I'd like to welcome your response. So we are talking about, you know, decoupling between US and China. So my own view is that there's no way they, they can decouple in manufacturing sector. The value chain, supply chain is too complicated. There's no way that uh, US and China can separate from each other in the global chain. I mean, but on the other hand, uh, in more like in a high tech area, like 5G or other area, I think it's quite possible uh, for decoupling. You know, I have done you know, a few guest lectures to Chinese university, okay, none of them use a Zoom. They have their own, <laughs> right? Their own you know, online you know, system, which is fine. So that kind of uh, you know, tells me that maybe in certain area, like uh, 5G and other area, China and United States may develop their own platform, uh, kind of decoupled, uh, which is quite likely. And then what is South Korea going to do? I mean, they're gonna use both of them, you know, pick or the other. I mean, here I'm using iPhone, but now, you know, you know Apple and, you know, also, you know, Google, they have a different operating system uh, for smartphone, which is fine, actually. So uh, that's sort of my kind of, you know, views on those issues. And I'd like to get your feedback, your comment. Uh, many uh, economists or the business uh, academics uh, in principle, uh, now they just suggest that basically the, the companies have to, uh, have to operate in the separate world. So not simply decouple is uh, the supply chain, is, is the production uh, process. Actually, now they try to serve two different uh, markets. So mm. 
for example, the, the, the semiconductor area, in case the, the US government actually is not implementing a secondary sanction like uh, the, the, the trade measure, probably the Samsung and SK Hynix maintain two different uh, factories, one in China, one in the United States, and then they operate basically differently and serving different market, probably using different technology there. The both countries desperately trying to nationalize is a process, technology, and uh, everything. So uh, probably when the US patented technologies are not allowed to be used in China and Chinese people try to desperately come up with their own uh, technology or method. So uh, probably the, the Samsung have to <laughs> operate mm. Completely two different uh, factories mm -hmm. to serve different markets. But uh, in some area that is feasible, but in some other product or area that may not be feasible. So uh, during the transition period, still we will be squeezed. And then uh, from the business point of view, it will increase hugely the transaction cost and uh, uh, many things. But nowadays this political risk just completely override every other business consideration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, from uh, the, uh, the, the long distance, I mean, probably when we look back this situation, uh, uh, many decades uh, later, it looked very stupid, but <laughs> we, never, uh, we, we, we never know uh, how these two different technology the ecosystem mm -hmm. were evolved and then uh, probably uh, the, the Chinese, the IT, ICT industry sector may just completely lose out. And by not being able to follow up this new, the state of the art, the standard or industry, uh, the, the, the regulation, they may just lose out uh, completely. So we never know what will happen. Um, but that is something the, the academics nowadays uh, routinely propose. Mm. Uh, Congressman Joe. Well, I guess uh, economic decoupling is such a, such a big word, probably uh, would not happen. I think US, uh, US interests is, is in making sure that China would not uh, replace the United States as the uh, source of the, uh, the technological platforms in the future. And second thing is that um, US is trying to make sure that uh, they would not depend upon China too much when it comes to the production capability and supply chains. So that's probably in US interests, but um, the coupling, I think such a big word probably would not happen. I'd like to talk very briefly about the, the uh, possibility and danger of economic decoupling between Japan and ROK. Mm -hmm. The um, economic um, the connectivity is the backbone mm -hmm. of the ROK Japan relations. But um, from last year, when Japan, Japanese government came up with some, some me economic measures to, to not to supply some of the, some of the parts and um, you know, the components to the ROK, if, if this trend continues, then US, the Korean, Korean companies will find the alternative source of supply. If that source continues, that, that will probably undermine and weaken the, uh, the very important foundation for the bilateral relations between Korea and Japan. And I think it's not in the interest of Korea, not in the interest mm -hmm. of Japan, not in the interest of the United States. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So going to North Korea, I mean, in a certain need now, you know, China gets most attention uh, in the States and North Korea doesn't get as much attention as under uh, you know, Trump. And now the Moon Jae-in government is trying to re-engage North Korea in you know, Pyongyang, but they've been quite silent. Uh, now, uh, as you mentioned, you know, Washington also conveyed their intent to engage uh, you know, Pyongyang, but they say, okay, I got your notes and <laughs> not much else. At the same time, uh, North Korea has been, you know, fairly quiet, not provoking anything, uh, you know, you know, for a while. So, 
what to expect uh, Pyongyang's uh, first step? Uh, do you think they will reach out to Seoul or they will ignore Seoul then uh, reach out to Washington uh, for talk or they will uh, make any provocation? So what should expect as their first move? I believe that North Korea doesn't have many options and uh, rejecting the offer for dialogue from Biden administration at this time would be uh, too risky for North Korea. So they will respond and come to the table and at, mm -hmm. at a minimum, listen to what Biden people will have to say for them, okay? And then uh, when they try to do that, they'll try to shore up uh, their backs, they, uh, they, their, their relations with China. So in the past, during the summit diplomacy between North Korea and, and, and United States, Kim Jong-un visited China so many times, both before and after mm -hmm. his meeting with President Trump. Mm -hmm. Now the coronavirus gets in the way, but, it, but I believe that some kind of uh, diplomatic prep work will take place mm -hmm. uh, probably before North Korea comes out to meet with the United States. Are okay, uh, unfortunately, uh, is out of the way. It really depends on the PRK, uh, whether they try to reestablish contact with ROK. Uh, Moon Jae-in government is, is very eager to do that, but um, North Korea makes a habit of um, denigrating ROK for, a, uh, for fun and also for strategic, uh, some strategic purposes, I believe. So if North Korea reaches out to ROK, that will mean that they are really, really desperate. Otherwise, they would not. So Dr. do you have anything to add? A very small point is North Korea um, economic situation is uh, one of the worst at this moment. They mm. are very desperate. So that situation probably uh, provoked North Korean mm. leader to make mm. some uh, surprising decision. Mm. Okay, so one question for uh, you know, both of you. Uh, in a few months, uh, you know, South Korea will be really getting into you know, election campaign uh, for next year uh, presidential election. And uh, typically, like in the United States, uh, what matters, not so much the foreign policy issue, but more domestic uh, issue. But in Korea, uh, I feel like uh, you know, foreign policy matters more than in this country. And we talked about a lot of issues like you know, China, US, Japan, uh, North Korea. I mean, do you expect any of those issues to become a major item for discussion or debate uh, during campaign? And if so, then what should they watch? The answer is probably no, <laughs> okay. probably not. But let me tell you a story. When I was involved in six party talks as director general of the foreign ministry, uh, whenever we had um, concluded meeting six party talks and um, I was asked to join the, the Ministry of Finance uh, officials to, to come to New York and meet with people from the uh, Moody's and other sovereign credit rating agencies. And they were interested, not as much about the current status of negotiation with North Korea. They were more interested about the current state of uh, the alliance between US and ROK. So they were uh, concerned. They, will be con they would be concerned if the alliance is not good shape. And I think the same can be said about the Korean public. The Korean public was frustrated by the lack of progress in negotiating with North Korea uh, for so many years now. So uh, they uh, wanted to have the issue, this issue being dealt with by professionals of Korean government and US government and other governments. So they are probably okay with that. But if they hear the news that the alliance between ROK and US is in bad shape, then I think they will be awakened to, uh, to, to take interest in the issues of national security. So mm. that will be my answer. Mm -hmm. Professor An? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with the, uh, Congressman Cho. Uh, domestically, we have a very prominent uh, issue like a real estate problems and so forth. So right. uh, 
the foreign issues may not be uh, the key, uh, the political campaign issue, but very interestingly, the current ruling party and the opposition party's foreign policy uh, appears to be almost contradicted, like mm -hmm. pro-China, pro-US, <laughs> pro-Japan, yeah. anti-Japan. <laughs> so, uh, for many uh, traditional uh, the, the diplomatic policy, the two parties uh, seems to be contradicted against each other. So probably from the voters' point of view, <laughs> it's much easier and clearer voting situations. I'm sorry that I cannot uh, address all the questions that uh, the audience raised, but uh, let me ask one final question. So. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be the summit uh, between uh, Moon Jae-in and Biden uh, in Washington next week. So what to expect? I mean, are you more optimistic uh, or more pessimistic or you don't expect much? I'm generally optimistic about the outcome because Biden, President Biden's intentions is to uh, make sure that the alliance is being perceived as in good shape, right? That's the whole purpose of inviting President Moon Jae-in. That's the whole purpose of U.S. sending Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense to ROK, right? Mm -hmm. So the public messaging will probably be okay. If the public messaging is problematic, that really means that relations are uh, mm -hmm. uh, in danger. So I'm sure mm -hmm. that um, the professionals can take care of the public messaging. So especially about North Korea. So in North Korea, I believe that there are fundamental difference in the thinkings and perceptions of Moon Jae-in government and thinkings and perceptions of Biden administration, but that will not come to the surface. So when it comes to public messaging, I was, I'll be more interested in look at the uh, outcomes about uh, say climate change because climate mm -hmm. change is important agenda and ROK is not doing exactly very well in terms of reducing the, car the uh, carbon, the, uh, the, the, the greenhouse gases these days. And then the technology, uh, the uh, alliance will be rather important issues. And also that um, perhaps some of, the, some of the rather crucial alliance management issues will be discussed. I hope that will be discussed between the two leaders so that the two militaries can take care of those issues and you know, maintain the alliance in good shape. So those climate change, technology, and the alliance management will come to the fore and I'll look at the outcomes of the meeting. When it comes mm -hmm. to North Korea, I think messaging will be good. I'll be more interested mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. actual discussions between mm -hmm. the two leaders in North Korea, mm -hmm. but it'll, it'll take some time for me to find out what exactly happened, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Right, uh, yeah, let me, yeah, very briefly. But still, uh, you need to see uh, like uh, the last part or some, some uh, uh, controversial expression there probably because as you know this is the last year of President Moon. Right. So both parties have some issue. The, the President Moon trying to push everything at the very the last effort. The Biden administration probably do not want does mm -hmm. not want to embrace this leaving president's uh, request. So there may be some interesting statements here and there. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's going to be very interesting. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insight. Uh, it has been great discussions and hopefully uh, we can bring you back uh, in person uh, once pandemic uh, is over. And I know that uh, most of the issues that we talked about, I don't think they will disappear anytime soon. I think this will you know, continue uh, to affect and shape uh, South Korean uh, you know, policy. So hopefully uh, we can continue our conversation uh, in the coming years. So once again, uh, thank you for uh, you joining us from Seoul and then uh, hopefully uh, we can reconvene uh, sometime in the near future. So thank you so much and then uh, have a good evening and, and good day in Seoul. Thank you.